and at the <coughs> intermediate stage, a chain can be terminated either by adding in hydrogen or losing in hydrogen, and then you get paraffins or olefins, or there can be some CO insertion which leads uh, together with hydrogen to these oxygenates. Why do we believe this? Well, there are basically two arguments. If you use rhodium manganese uh, at pressures in the order of 100 uh, bar, then you can get oxygenates up to C6 uh, and C7. And if you plot the schulz flory lines for the oxygenates and for the hydrocarbons, then the two lines are basically parallel. And that strongly suggests that the chain growth is the same for all these compounds, only the termination uh, decides which of the <coughs> products is formed. The other support for this uh, general chemistry is this uh, work which uh, Orita and Tamaru did years ago, again with uh, rhodium manganese, when they use an isotopic switch that uh, they changed from uh, one labeled CO to the other carbon labeled CO. Then they found for acid aldehyde that the methyl group and the aldehyde group had a completely different history. The aldehyde group was very quickly the composition of the new isotope after the switch, whereas the methyl group uh, slowly uh, acquired that composition. And that was on the same curve as methane and uh, uh, propane and so forth. So obviously the undissociated CO on the surface, which is in a virtually reversible equilibrium with the gas phase, is inserted and responsible for the other group, uh, whereas dissociative adsorption, which is virtually irreversible, uh, determines this here. But that still doesn't answer the question, how does the promoter in this example, the manganese, do that then? Some time ago, we stuck out our necks and uh, speculated uh, about uh, uh, this kind of a model that uh, manganese might be uh, interacting with the oxygen end of CO. And uh, the, we had some indications, actually, that some tilted CO is on the surface. This model was never really proven, nor was it ever disproven. So we decided to start a totally different approach. In the years since we didn't touch that subject, uh, we learned something about how to manipulate catalysts in zeolite uh, and to control uh, how you get atoms and ions into the cages of a zeolite which you wish them to have. We therefore took the zeolite white photocyte, which, as you know, has three types of cages, a super cage, a sodalite cage, and the hexanol prism. And so we started now this work with the purpose uh, to get rhodium clusters and manganese ions or uh, some other compounds uh, into the same super cage and see whether this uh, had uh, the desired effect. I should say a bit about the experimental because that turns out to be important. Uh, we used ion exchange and in all results I want to discuss today, we started with the manganese which was first ion exchange, and then uh, uh, the catalyst was uh, heated uh, to remove all the uh, water, and the manganese uh, was distributed over the cages. Uh, and in the second instance, then the rhodium was uh, ion exchange. Again, a calcination step uh, followed, and uh, a finally a reduction step with hydrogen. Uh, we have done a lot of TPR, which I will not describe. You just have to take my word for it that uh, in all the reduced catalysts I am going to discuss, the rhodium is zero valent and the manganese is, has a valency 2 plus. Uh, that is different for other things. We have studied also uh, rhodium iron, for instance, and iron is in part reduced so that you get an alloy, also in palladium iron, uh, you get the alloy. In the manganese case, this is not the case. Uh, the, uh, we are quite confident that manganese is only present in our catalysts uh, at the valency 2 plus. Uh, you see the rhodium is uh, uh, officially starting uh, as a monochloro uh, substituted uh, cation, but uh, during this uh, ion exchange, which takes about a day, uh, there is complete ligand exchange. So what is in the zeolite is the monarcho uh, pentaamine complex, no chlorine ever 
uh, enters our zero life step. We might also mention that, and that will be important uh, at the second part of this talk, that the calcination procedure is of very uh, important uh, effect. You can calcine at a high temperature, and then you get naked rhodium ions. And that means when you reduce them with hydrogen, you get uh, atoms, of course, plus protons. Then the zeolite has an acidity. You can, however, direct the uh, calcination at a temperature where all the superfluous water uh, is removed, but uh, there is enough of the penta uh, amine complex uh, uh, retained that you have uh, not the naked ion, but uh, still partially, for instance, with a three amine ligand uh, uh, aminated ion. And if you reduce that uh, with hydrogen, you do not get protons, but you get, of course, ammonium ions. Uh, you can, uh, well, let's first show uh, some results, all at uh, 10 bar, all at low conversion in the differential regime. And uh, here we see that in the absence of uh, manganese, whatever we do, uh, we get uh, uh, methane, we get the higher uh, hydrocarbons, zero oxygenate. So under these conditions, uh, uh, manganese is a necessary condition. But it is not a sufficient condition. If you use this catalyst here, where uh, just uh, the two elements were ion exchanged and then reduced, uh, uh, then the oxygenates are uh, absent. You get, although it does contain manganese, uh, uh, only the same uh, similar signature as the unpromoted catalyst. Now, you may wonder whether this is uh, because the manganese has been chased into the small cages, so it cannot actually interact with the rhodium. We uh, uh, studied that, and uh, we are sure we can exclude it. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, some of our samples were then uh, uh, kindly studied uh, in Munich by Professor Knötzinger. And uh, here are the infrared data when CO is added. For the rhodium only catalyst, you find the usual zoo, the uh, 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 two pairs of bands for the two uh, coordinations of the uh, dicarbonyl rhodium cation. Uh, you find that the bridging, triple bridging, and the linear the CO, you find the uh, rhodium uh, uh, clusters, the rhodium 6, uh, CO16, and so forth. Uh, if you have manganese there, you find a totally different pattern. And I don't want to go into any details. You see, these are very sharp spectra. But uh, if one thing is certain, then it is that the manganese and the rhodium can interact in that zeolite. They are not imprisoned in totally different cages. Now, you said, you saw then that our first promoted catalysts didn't produce any oxygenates, and we had some uh, suspicions, and we discussed that this morning, that the protons which you produce when you reduce the catalyst are important. So we used a reduced catalyst, neutralized it by immersing it into sodium hydroxide, and uh, mildly reducing it again, and now you get the uh, very significant uh, formation of the oxygenates. So protons have certainly something to do with our lack of oxygenates for the non-neutralized catalysts. And what oxygenates do we get? It is mainly ethanol. It is uh, also uh, ethyl acetate, even diethyl ether, uh, and uh, very little of the C1 uh, and the photopart, so some methyl acetate, uh, dimethyl ether, and some methanol. So it is mainly the group of C2 oxygenates, if you permit me to call ethyl acetate a C2, which is, of course, uh, not strictly correct, but you understand what I mean. So up to this point, we can conclude from the variety and the totality of experiments we did. <coughs> if you want to have a high selectivity for oxygenates, two conditions are ne necessary the presence of the manganese, this is the atomic ratio here which we usually use, uh, and the absence of protons. Now then you ask yourself, what are the, these protons doing? Why do we get 
uh, no oxygen needs. Now, you can think of two conceivable hypotheses. The trivial one is that protons just are active sites in their own right, and they convert the primary oxygenates to other less uh, attractive things. So what you do then is layered bed experiments. You use this neutralized catalyst of which you know it, uh, is doing a good job, and uh, behind it, downstream, you have uh, a proton-containing catalyst, we just do HY. And indeed, for a long time, absolutely no oxygenates are formed. After a long time, a few appear. So uh, these <coughs> protons uh, apparently destroy, in secondary reaction, the primary oxygenates. And uh, uh, finally, when the, the protons are presumably neutralized, uh, uh, there is a chance that uh, some oxygenates come through. You do the control experiment by just reversing the order of the two catalyst beds. And uh, so this repeats the previous slide. Uh, and now if you do it this way, that the, uh, the uh, syngas first uh, goes for the HY bed, and then for this one, then you get the full glory of your oxygenates. So one conclusion is uh, trivial. Protons destroy oxygenates, and that's one possible, or well, certainly one of the reasons why uh, you must kill these protons if you want to make oxygenates. That doesn't prove, however, that this is the only reason. There is still some other hypothesis conceivable. If we think of the simple high school chemistry of what happens to manganese <coughs> in aqueous solution and also in the zeolite, then uh, we know that uh, in a uh, low pH uh, environment, we will have it as an iron. Uh, in a high pH, of course, you get the hydroxide. And if you have that inside our zeolite channels uh, uh, and we calcine the material uh, in the upper definition, then of course it will get the oxide and the oxide takes oxygen. So you get MnO2 and we see that happen actually, the color changes. Uh, and if you have that situation and you reduce it, uh, then uh, when I made that remark in the beginning, you reduce uh, easily, but it stops at this situation. So this is clusters of manganese oxide. These are manganese ions. And so with our neutralization, it is uh, conceivable that we change the nature of the manganese from this to that. And so we can ask the question, could it be that these two uh, reincarnations of the divalent magnesium manganese, manganese could have different effects on the selectivity? So we tried to study that. Uh, that is a bit more difficult because now you have to separate things that the same procedure which kills the protons uh, uh, for the secondary reaction might also um, uh, do this uh, job which I just described. But uh, fortunately, this chemistry of ions and zeolites gives you uh, more opportunities, and I had already alluded to that uh, uh, at the beginning. Uh, we can calcine at high temperature Reduce and then we get the protons, which, if we wish, we can neutralize. But we can also um, uh, calcine at 200. Then we retain uh, some amines, not necessarily five, and then we reduce that with hydrogen. We will get no protons. So, uh, so we have two different ways. And before you just believe my word for that, uh, let me at least show you. Uh, the infrared spectrum of the reduced catalyst uh, reduced at the same temperature uh, when you calcine at the, uh, either of these two temperatures and it proves what I just said that if you calcine at high temperature then you reduce it uh, you get the, the strong OH peaks and that's how the protons show up in the zeolite if you were cautious to maintain and retain some of your amine ligands uh, then uh, these peaks are virtually gone. So this is an efficient way of uh, controlling the proton concentration. And knowing this, we now did the decisive experiment, uh, which I will describe now. So imagine you first exchange manganese uh, uh, into the zeolite, and you separate your sample into two halves. One you uh, um, uh, neutralize by immersing it one half uh, 
in uh, sodium hydroxide so that you get the hydroxide uh, inside the gel, inside the, uh, the um, uh, cages. Uh, and then you calcine it, and then you get, of course, the oxide. You see the color change, uh, and uh, uh, that is uh, there. And with the other, you don't do that. Here, the manganese is still present as Mn2+. Then the further treatment is identical for both halves. Uh, you ion exchange the rhodium, and you calcine the rhodium at 200 to make sure that you don't create any acid sites which uh, could do something. So once you have done that, you have uh, two catalysts with a virtually identical signature as far as the rhodium is concerned, as far as the absence of proton is concerned, uh, but one contains the manganese as uh, uh, small MNO particles inside the zeolite cages, uh, and the other contains it as uh, the uh, manganese ions. And this is now the crucial experiment, and I just show you the result. Here, manganese present as manganese ions. So that procedure which I just described, just skipping the immersion in the sodium hydroxide, and that here is the uh, thing which had been uh, neutralized before the rhodium was added. So uh, the, the rhodium uh, uh, reduction and, and any proteins from rhodium have nothing to do with the sodium hydroxide that was in that period after the manganese uh, uh, ion exchange and the, uh, before any exchange of the rhodium. So the conclusion looks to us rather uh, unambiguous and ines uh, inescapable. The promoter to make oxygenates is not the manganese ion. These are the manganese particles. So apart from the trivial conclusion which I mentioned earlier, that protons also destroy oxygenates, which are uh, uh, created over a well-promoted neutralized catalyst. Uh, the most important conclusion, in our um, opinion, is that the true promoter are these clusters, uh, which convert which are, uh, the uh, thin gas to oxygenates. From this fact on, we can now start a lot of speculation, but I think I better keep that separated. We do believe that the rhodium clusters and the manganese oxide clusters are inside the same cage. They are really in physical contact. And uh, so the chemistry of uh, catalyst promotion is a chemistry of uh, uh, a two-phase contact, if you call a small cluster a phase. And um, from that onward, we can now uh, study, and if you wish, in the discussion, I would be happy to do that, the models uh, how we can imagine this uh, uh, further chemistry uh, leading to the formation of the oxygenates. Let me actually not speculate now, but uh, uh, close uh, after having mentioned the facts, but not without having uh, thanked uh, first uh, Helmut Knözinger and uh, Pilman, uh, who did these infrared uh, uh, spectra in uh, Munich. Uh, uh, and uh, we have also, and I have not mentioned much of that, uh, this uh, cooperation with uh, third party uh, Renato Ugo and Carlo Dossi in Milano. Uh, who made uh, some of the samples for us uh, in the absence of any oxygen, just, uh, any hydrogen, just uh, from organic metallic uh, uh, compounds. And of course, I want to express my gratitude to the uh, Department of Energy who enabled us uh, to do this work. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Question. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, in your case, the protein is very important uh, for direction. But uh, is there any the chemical bonding between the protein of the sodium white zeolite and the uh, rhodium particle? So for example, the rhodium hydride. Yeah. Um, uh, the answer is yes. Of course, we have uh, just done now uh, our best to uh, destroy that. But we are doing we are doing quite some work with this rhodium. And in uh, the generality, the answer is yes. We have for the rhodium as we have for the palladium uh, rhodium hydrogen adducts, where the uh, proton or hydrogen atom, whatever you call it, uh, uh, is bridging between the oxygen of the zeolite and the metal atoms. Uh, we have, uh, you may be aware, uh, published a lot about that in the case of uh, palladium, where uh, this is uh, the uh, 
uh, way to stabilize very high dispersion, even monoatomic palladium or platinum we have been able to make in this case by, by uh, stabilizing it with the uh, proton adducts. Uh, that metal is therefore always uh, uh, as a uh, parlance goes, uh, electron deficient because the positive charge of the proton and the uh, uh, mixes in or is in part shared by the metal. So yes, when you have uh, uh, rhodium and protons uh, together in the same zeolite, then uh, rhodium uh, proton adducts are formed. Here we have done our best to avoid it. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm interested in occasional manganese oxide in the mixed uh, uh, rhodium manganese inside of the rice cage. Uh, I wonder if uh, the models of the decorates uh, the uh, catalyst of the manganese rhodium it uh, will be uh, the reflected in the, the sea or chemical absorption mode uh, to giving is a low frequency carbon bands. Uh, do you have any uh, particular? Uh, no, this uh, f uh, famous frequency, which uh, if you and I then uh, assume to be responsible for this tilted CO, uh, we find sometimes, but we do not find always. Uh, so therefore, uh, uh, I hesitate uh, uh, with what we know now uh, to uh, call that uh, an important uh, part. Uh, but of course, there is contact, and uh, our uh, our electron microscopy shows the uh, rhodium is inside the zeolite. Uh, one uh, aspect which I didn't mention, but since we didn't under don't understand it yet completely, is that uh, the growth mechanism of the rhodium particles uh, uh, is also affected uh, by the manganese. You have a uh, uh, little growth uh, during the reduction, but uh, during syngas catalysis, when you get all these carbonyls, of course, uh, then uh, there is a growth, uh, and uh, much of the rhodium particles uh, attains a, uh, a size uh, of uh, 25 uh, Ohmstrom inside the zeolite, which means local destruction, of course. Uh, uh, but there is a bimodal distribution, some part is uh, outside, uh, and that uh, growth process is affected by the uh, manganese. Uh, and uh, I don't understand it in, in detail yet. Uh, but there is interaction, which, by the way, the infrared spectra of uh, Helmut so Knudsen will show quite find well. any evidence for the direct interaction of manganese oxide and rhodium particles uh, and uh, any locations? Uh, how this, uh, uh, no, we have not uh, been able yet, but we, we, this is uh, what we hope to do. Try again in our next uh, trip uh, uh, to find any excess uh, interaction. So, when we last had uh, beam time for that, uh, we uh, didn't know yet uh, how to optimize our catalyst as we know now. And uh, of course, uh, mind you, if we have a, a two to one ratio and we have rhodium clusters of, I don't know, let's say 10 atoms, uh, and in each of these, uh, these uh, cages where there is a a uh, rhodium cluster of 10 atoms, uh, there may be then uh, two or three uh, uh, manganese atoms. That means the majority of the manganese atoms is elsewhere. And that's, uh, but you see with excepts, of course, you see always the majority which uh, uh, gives uh, you the result. Uh, we know how to control the going in and out of the manganese, uh, the small cages. When you just heat, it heats in the small cages, but we know how to get it out again uh, by means of uh, uh, ligancy with water. But that's a different story which goes beyond your question. in terms of elementary steps and the connections between fischer tropsch chemistry and now the rhodium chemistry. Uh, there first were these nice plots where the oxygenates were nicely in parallel. However, now I, I thought I understood it's mainly ethanol which is being produced now with these clusters. They are termed oxygenates, but I feel it's more ethanol what's being produced. I'm not so sure. Let me be clear about that. It's, it's, it's just a minute there. Uh, it's a very important point there. Yeah. I stressed the parallel lines where we got the oxygenates down to C7, we obtained at 100 bar. Yeah. And uh, this work here is done at 10 bar. Yeah. And so we do not get uh, these uh, long oxygenates under these conditions. So there is a, a difference in experimental error. Moreover, the logics of the schulz flory um, uh, distribution says uh, uh, you uh, should have the same uh, growth mechanism, so the same uh, ratio of termination to, uh, to chain growth, uh, but it is not forbidden that the number one is above the schulz flory curve. Now, if you believe in chain growth and uh, termination by CO, then the ethanol is number one. It's the first, the C1 
yeah. chain, quote unquote, uh, CO, so that uh, the uh, uh, C2 oxygenates uh, are therefore. Uh, uh, could be uh, uh, above the schulz flory curve, wouldn't uh, violate the uh, logics of that mechanism. Yes, but the main point with the iron catalysts in the Fischer-Tropsch regime, there are also these uh, homologous series of aldehydes yeah. and alcohols. Yeah. And I'm not uh, totally sure if it's the same elemental reaction of CO terminating the chain, because if you add oxygenates, there the CO bond is easily split, and it could be another mechanism which makes the oxygenates there, maybe an OH added to the chain at the terminating reaction. I'm not sure what it is, but I'm not uh, uh, convinced that it's the same chemistry. Could be or could be not. <laughs> if there are those microphones in the room, I'm quite willing to speculate what I think at this moment. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 without giving uh, all the argumentations, uh, so, uh, results by Iwa Sawa are very important. Uh, that, uh, uh, he uh, identified that, that the same ruthenium cluster, which uh, is a carbon cluster, uh, of six atoms, uh, which uh, he can uh, really characterize uh, with excepts very well, uh, when it is uh, unsupported uh, uh, in under CO hydrogenation, it makes uh, oxygenates. When it is supported on certain oxides, uh, it gives uh, it, it gives hydrocarbons, but oxide uh, on it gives oxygenates. We have the same situation that the phase contact is important. Uh, so it uh, is quite conceivable to me. That it looks quite conceivable to me that uh, what actually happens is on our say manganese oxide particles, CO is adsorbed, and following the water gas shift uh, uh, idea, a formate is formed. That the the, could be the unidentate or the bidentate formate. Uh, and if you have a formate on a manganese uh, oxide particle and a, uh, say, a CH2 group on, on a rhodium particle, and they are in, in physical contact, it's yeah. very easy to imagine. I have no proof, it's imagination, that this gives the acetate. And I believe the acetate is the actual precursor. Why, don't we, uh, why do we get so much uh, uh, ethyl acetate? Uh, we have yeah. the acetate, which can be partly reduced to ethanol, or the ethanol can react with the, rather, uh, the other acetate. So that's how our thinking goes at this moment. But now I really uh, mm -hmm. am not talking about proven facts anymore. But it's not uh, totally for sure that the mechanism is the same with the iron catalysts and the oxygenates there, and here to the rhodium. The manganese system. It's the elemental steps for oxygenates making, producing, if they are the same or not. How far do we want to go with the speculation? I mean, <laughs> let, me, let me now remain on the solid ground of the rhodium <laughs> for this particular discussion. We have a last question from Professor Khan. Wolfgang, you are saying that the manganese is not reduced. Isn't that, surpri isn't that not surprising? No, it is not. I mean, uh, if you look at the uh, uh, stability of the manganese oxide compared to the iron oxide, uh, it is uh, quite uh, uh, conceivable that uh, under the same thermodynamic conditions where uh, the iron oxide is, or the uh, iron ion, I should say, is reduced in contact with palladium and with uh, rhodium, uh, the manganese is not. And all our TPR data show that, and also the uh, the, the, the IR data. In, in when you have an alloy, you get a different, uh, different uh, kind of, um, uh, of IR uh, spectrum when you adsorb CO. So uh, manganese is less noble than iron. That's uh, that's a simple uh, answer to to your question. Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.